Look, I'm a woman who leads a busy life. As such, I deeply value how I spend my relaxation time each night after a hard day talking about anime on the internet. Lately, I've been making a point to sit down before bed to watch a new weird old OVA each night. The upside is that I've seen a whole bunch of weird new arcane anime. The downside, depending on who you ask anyway, is that I've now conditioned myself to be lulled to sleep to this. As with everything in my life, this has turned from nice thing I do to unwind to thing I am feverishly working on a video about. Because look, these are so interesting. We're talking about the art that flooded out of Japan's economic peak and for the first time onto Western shores and all its violent, transgressive, dubious glory. And yes, the stories behind a lot of these works and how they crossed international borders are often just as interesting as the anime themselves. That video I did on me and Naage Chow was 50 minutes long for a reason. For the uninformed, the world of 80s and 90s original video animations, anime produced or distributed specifically for the home video market, just have a style and ethos all to themselves. The ridiculously flashy sakuga, the incomprehensible pacing as they try to cram entire stories into 40 minute time slots, the gratuitous violence, gratuitous sudden sex fucking, gratuitous use of the word cyber, the baffling music decisions, machine trans translated comic sans subs and horrible transfer quality, the rapidly flashing lights, ow, okay, ow, maybe not that part, I actually do have photosensitivity issues, I suffered for y'all. Initially, I was picking titles at random that jumped out to me and were on YouTube, but as I realized how many ways this begun to mirror aspects of the then contemporary experience, I leaned fully in. So let me lay bare for you the process that would lead me to watch literally more than 30 OVAs for this. First off, I compiled an index of entries from two lists I found on Letterboxd, mostly grabbing shit based solely off their cover art and titles, sometimes a short blurb. After all, unless you had a magazine or a fancy catalog, the most you could learn about a given anime was through what was on the back of the box and word of mouth. The downside of my slapdash approach though was that I learned in my subsequent research phase some of these titles didn't even ever come out on VHS, which I for the most part disqualified from discussion here, save for a few exceptions. To replicate the relative scarcity and lack of standardization for VHS releases in the West at the time, I grabbed the absolute first version of each OVA that came to me. Sometimes they were dubbed, sometimes they were subbed, sometimes they were completely raw, sometimes they weren't even complete uploads. There are a few anime in this video I haven't even watched all of. Let me tell you, the few times I clicked on a title and got a high quality transfer, I felt like I'd won the fucking lottery. I won't make you suffer how I did though, and you all have my homie go long to thank for that. Dude has the hookup and sent me tens of gigs worth of the cleanest transfers he could get his hands on. So thanks for being the person to go on the government watch list reserved for people who download butt attack punisher girl Gotamon in my place. Which, of course, I had access to far more than the average 90s weeaboo could even dream of, but I wasn't about to limit myself only to titles that saw western releases. Like, you heard the title of that anime. We got big fish to fry. On that note, let's lay down some ground rules here. This shit isn't for everyone. It's sleazy, it's grimy, it's gross, it's all at least a little bit objectionable by the standards of most. Anything can happen in these, and I'm not going to warn you about the content in each and every one. That'd be redundant. As always, I'll keep the super gnarly stuff off screen, but just, you know, do your research before diving into any of these if you're sensitive to certain things in media. Furthermore, just because I don't acknowledge certain things herein or sketchy when I bring them up doesn't mean I don't see them for what they are. These are just things you have to make concessions with as a fan of art that follows this anything goes mentality. Lastly, I'm not going to go very in depth on the plot summaries here. I'm way more about exploring how they feel and what makes them unique rather than what actually happens within them. So with all that being said, when you think anime on VHS, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Roski Doji? Ninja Scroll? Akira? Nausicaa? 
Dragon Ball Z Dead Zone? Yep, that's right, 1986's Call Me Tonight, an anime with no English release, even today. Coming at you live from the director of Oliver y Benji. Call Me Tonight is a darling little love story about a woman working at a phone sex line and a guy who turns into an alien monster whenever he pops a boner. I know, really easing us in here, but look, this thing is actually really cute for what it is. It's predictable on a beat by beat level, and the animation isn't exactly stellar, but it's just oozing with charm. A prime example of something you can feel was made out of love for its medium and its influences. Like, there's blatant references to Fright Night and Galaxy of Terror. You can hear the room the voice actors recorded in. <laughs> It's chock full of tropes and character archetypes. All the monsters the main guy turns into are all fully realized in their designs, despite being on screen for such a short span of time. At just a half hour, it's here for a good time, not a long time. Plus, holy shit, the goddamn OST, which is the slickest city pop this side of your recommended videos tab. Fuck. Ah, if you're not doing the K-Fed head bob just listening to this in the background, I'm sorry, you're beyond help. Another that's really got it all and then some is Fight Aixer 1. Space opera, body horror, fighting spirit mecha, tentacles all over, lesbian overtones, barely comprehensible lore, and a whole lot of vaginal imagery. Do you get it? My, my microphone is picking up radio waves. I don't know why. I don't know if you can hear it. I probably need to get a new one. Patreon.com slash go fuck yourself. For being just 90 minutes long, this thing feels gargantuan. It's kind of earnestly horrific, too. It delivers on its sleeve worn Cronenbergian, Carpenterian influences. Parents die, more parents die, small children are almost stomped to death, the transformations are twisted. It unfortunately sheds that body horror pretty quickly after the first third, but it also gets like way gayer, so the hazel chorometer balances itself out. I haven't seen much mecha anime, so I can't say one way or the other how much of a trailblazer it is in this regard, but I get the impression this thing was pretty significant in how it synthesized so many different elements that otaku reacted strongly to in anime of the era. Very bio-otaku for otaku. More by otaku for otaku, but in this case, otaku making media for themselves and themselves alone is Dragon's Heaven. And despite the singularity of self-indulgent vision, it's so fucking captivating to look at that it comes fully recommended. Bro, she kisses the fucking robot on the cheek, on his little robot cheek. That's so fucking cute. I, uh, turns out I had another microphone, uh, that's like almost the same kind as uh, the one that I was using before, so all is well. So much so that it doesn't even matter that this was clearly supposed to be a four episode OVA that got whittled down to just one. Why did it get such a treatment? Well, the story goes that the guys working on this thing were huge in the early garage kit scene and blew the vast majority of their animation budget on creating these massive physical props that make up the opening sequence. Are we as a species better off for having a single OVA carry the weight of what was clearly a larger story in exchange for a sequence where two massive animatronics struggle to hobble toward one another? Absolutely. All right, we're going in reverse alphabetical order for this next one, I guess, and for this next one only, from Dragon Heaven to Dragon Half. Starring a top tier stupid idiot bimbo girl, Mink, who is, if you couldn't guess, half dragon, the OVA is a lot less interested in the whole half dragon thing than it is being a bokeh tsukomi routine where you, the audience, are the bokeh every time. It's really dumb, huge dumb guy energy all over this one. That's not a bad thing or anything. I mean, the plot revolves around Mink's desperation to secure a ticket to see her favorite musician, who is named I Fuck You Not. Dick Saucer. Dick Saucer. Dick Saucer. I love the weird angular art style. Half this thing is in the chibi zone. Dragon Half is based on a manga from 88, which also had a PC 98 game based on it, so I get the feeling it's pretty cult popular. What can I say? I'm a sucker for cute girls with scratchy voices being stupid. Which is why I was primed to adore the first Project Echo OVA. 
This one's pretty well known and beloved amongst the old heads, which makes perfect sense because as a friend of the channel and fellow trash art patrician Spooky Coochie put it, this is anime, the anime. If you want a singular sub 90 minute distillation of what otaku of the mid 80s sought out, it's all here. You want to see lesbian schoolgirls with superpower fighting alien mechs? You want to literally die? Drink every time this thing references other anime. Eiko even does the late to school toast run. I've actually done this before at like 4am on my way to an opening shift when I used to work as a barista. It's hard to eat while you're winded. End in motion. Big choking hazard. I, I don't recommend it. I do recommend Project Echo though, to most anyone watching with an interest in the medium's history. It'll give you some vintage anime street cred, but with it being one of the first major titles to see stateside release. I'm honestly a little sick of talking about early 90s anime distributors though, so let me focus on just one element. A single VHS couldn't hold a ton of information, which obviously is why anime was released in several episode batches on the medium. This was true in both Japan and elsewhere. OVAs were pumped out in the 80s and 90s because it was literally just cheaper than getting a whole 12 episode series greenlit. Oftentimes, the first OVA in a series was more like a demo made to gauge interest for the release of subsequent episodes. This is also why OVAs were so much of what was brought out for the non-television market in the West. With a full series, you inherently have diminishing returns in publishing a long-running series. The first tape is always going to sell the most, even as time progresses. So if you can fit everything onto just one or two tapes, once you factor in licensing costs, a top production costs, you're much safer. Which bitch is the same shit is why I'm invested in writing about this. Being someone who catalogs everything I watch, read, listen to, whatever the fuck, there is no feeling more elating than sitting down to watch something for barely an hour and being able to cross it off a list. But again, I don't have to contend with cost as a factor anywhere along the way. Contemporarily, each VHS would run you like 30 fucking dollars, so OVAs weren't total bank breakers in order to get a full experience. While I grew up with VHS, my history with anime plants me squarely in the DVD generation, and it was expensive to me then, as a broke weeb from a poor family, to have to spend 30 to 40 dollars on an entire 26 episode anime. To be fair, in the 90s dubs were a bit cheaper, usually running around 20 to 25 dollars give or take, but you know, with dubs, you get what you get. Let me know next time. I'll soap your tits for you. Whoa, hey! <laughs> The fuck do you want me to say? It's one of the greatest, most influential stories ever told, animated in lurid peak bubble form. Its only issue is that it was left unfinished because the bubble literally burst while the second OVA was being animated. Did y'all know it was Glenn Danzig who pushed for this OVA's release? Yeah, apparently his comics label, Verotic, translated the manga. So look, this thing is pretty infamous purely for how, uh, oh fuck, 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 extraordinary its dub is, and while I'm remiss to center my own look around the dub, I think this thing gets a fucking bum rep. Look, I'll spit my shit. I think this dub is great for what it is. Is it okay for me to wear my shoes in here? I don't give a shit. Dubbed by Worldwide Sound, a British company but with American actors. How dare you say my knickers are hideous! This thing is, uh, idiosyncratic for sure. It's true what they say, smoking's bad for your health, especially when it's your own flesh you're smoking. There's no denying that, but have y'all read Devilman? That entire manga is idiosyncratic. The abundance of left field cuss saying and general stiltedness fits right in with how impressionistic the work's tone has always been. Plus, Devilman is an exploitation horror film in manga form, so localizing it as one just feels right. I might be an iconoclast in this regard, but I'm kind of all for localizations, dubs especially punching up a series by adding more cursing if the tone fits. As we'll get into later, it's obviously not a one-size-fits-all solution, but with how casual cursing is just kind of the fucking norm these days, I see no reason not to take advantage of that to make dialogue more naturalistic. I don't know, I also have a sailor's mouth and have a hearty tolerance for old dub-isms, so hearing even baby-faced good boy pre-devil merger Akira say fuck you or pronounce Miki's name as Mickey Makamura doesn't faze me in the slightest. 
Simply put, it's hard to know what to say about Devilman as a story because so much ink has already been used in its name to date. Like, there's just not much left to say that hasn't been already. You can feel Devilman in like every modern manga, you know? Something I did observe in all my watching for this video is that it works out in a funny sort of way that these OVAs never got to depict the apocalyptic stuff because that final stretch is present in so many other OVAs. They ran because Devilman walked. Like how the success of Star Wars saw a rise in space-themed anime being both produced and internationally distributed, the late 80s into the 90s saw a demand for grit and sleaze at a time when the mainstream first began to flirt with the comparatively darker counterculture. Anime has always been a bit fringe in the eyes of the English-speaking masses, but in such a fashion that makes it enticing and attractive to those invested in subculture. I've talked about this before in the much more specific framework of aughts anime, but it's a phenomenon that also helps to explain just why there was so much edge getting shipped off to our shores. And it's with this in mind that we now enter the anime on VHS saga's Demon Havoc arc. In his book, Otaku, Japan's Database Animals, cultural critic Hiroki Azuma posits that the anime proclivity of freely mixing Western and Eastern folklore is endemic of generations of Japanese artists coming gradually to terms with the country's loss in the Second World War and its subsequent occupation by the United States. He describes the process of creating and proliferating anime amongst otaku first and foremost, a process of domesticating... Uh, okay, okay. I'll speed it up a little bit. That book is required reading if you give even the slightest shit about anime though, I swear. What you need to know is that there are a lot of fucking OVAs about demon hunting and that a lot of them pretty freely blend together Western and Eastern aesthetics and folklore. Some Western film trends here, some yokai there, it's a veritable spice rack up in this bitch. I'm not gonna lie though, these all started to mix together for me, so I'm gonna speed through them a bit. There's a lot of ground to cover here. Wicked City. More like whipped shitties, because this thing was doing fucking donuts on me. What I mean is, I found it kind of hard to follow. This is where the whole watching things before bed thing kind of kicked me in the teeth, because I was actively drifting in and out of consciousness while watching it. Don't take that as any sort of indictment against its quality or anything. I trust this thing has the status it has for a reason. I just, uh, barely remember any of it. These kinds of OVAs especially, there's kind of two main categories here. We, we've got the, the dudes rock cinema and a woman in trouble. What I mean is, Wicked City is very much an OVA about a bulky big dude muscle man, and that's fine, that's great. It's just not especially compelling to me in this case. I'll just fucking say it though, Spider Bitch can get it. It's too much context to get into here, but this was actually banned in the UK for a while, very much like the many domestic video nasties of the 70s and 80s. If you're familiar with the era of video nasties, you'll know that each of those films has found a bit of a status symbol in having been banned. It was more or less proof that they were doing just that good of a job at being shocking or controversial, totally separate of the film's quality. And that's definitely a facet of Wicked City's legacy. As for its sequel, Demon City Shinjuku, you know, of appears in Johnny Mnemonic fame, I couldn't finish it. Sorry, it just wasn't in the mood. For a very different reason, I was also unable to finish Maru Senki, which is a shame because I actually enjoyed the animation and imagery within. The first 10 minutes of this thing are what people in the 90s who didn't really know what anime looked like probably thought anime looked like. Neon streets, girls, drunken old kung fu man, random nudity shifting swiftly into body horror. Just the fucking way this thing looks, with the blue background, red blood shit, that color scheme is what 80s anime looks like to me. Like all of them of this kind, my mind just conjures up deep blacks and blues and grimy reds especially Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei, which probably sounds familiar to you because it double billed with Minna Agechao to a few indie theaters in Japan. Also because it launched some massive RPG franchise, I don't know, it just kind of looks like some Pokemon ripoff, whatever. There's a lot of good, oh god, oh no, everything's fucked imagery all over the place in this one. The version I watched had some truly horrible data moshing going on, but I was kind of into it. I also often feel as though there are demons trapped in my computer, desperate to escape. Oh, wow. I generally try to pronounce words the correct way. It doesn't always go right, but I do my best to strike a balance between accurate but also sounds right in the context of an English spoken sentence. This title is 
a philosophical nightmare on all fronts. The anime it's attached to is just, man, it is painfully obscure across the board. I don't think it's ever even been subbed. I couldn't find it subbed anyway. I still watched it though, because this thing is right up my alley from a purely visual standpoint. Just girls fighting demons. What's better than this? Works out that this was one of the few that I couldn't find subbed because the theming here is very clear. Damn dude, sometimes puberty makes you feel like you're a fucking body horror monster, getting all gross with fingernails tearing and noses exploding. We've all been there. All right, fuck yeah, Demon Hunter Makaryudo. This one was probably my favorite of the whole demon hunting bunch. There's just something very simple and charming about it. It's like being a big JRPG head and going from a ton of Xenogears EPS1 titles to just chilling with an easy breezy little Famicom game. It's also just got such appealing character designs. The titular hunter's weird familiar and hair scythe are fucking sick takes the prerequisite cool monster box too. All in all, I found the pathos very believable in such a short time. If you watch one anime from the Demon Havoc arc, make it this. Unless, of course, you're nasty, in which case you've probably already seen Orotsukitochi, Legend of the Overfiend, brought here on the wings of Central Park Media's Anime 18 line, with hopes of being the Western world's next grind houseier Akira, Orotsuki Doji is perhaps the single most infamous anime in the eyes of the states. It's often touted as being a super influential piece of Arrowgirl animation for its, uh, innovative use of appendages, but take a look at all this other anime. All of this came out either before or the same year as the first Orotsuki Doji OVA. It's crazy, I've spent 25 years of my life thinking Orotsuki Doji was the first reigning king of tentacle porn anime, but there are anime that predate even the manga that feature the fully featured tentacle. Fuck, in an interview with goddamn Anthony Bourdain, author Toshio Maeda outright states himself, the inventor of the phallic tentacle, but that's quite evidently not true. Hilariously, he does confirm it was a matter of circumventing censorship laws surrounding depicting coitus, which was the story I'd always heard growing up. Japan's history with tentacled consummation is dense enough that it has its own Wikipedia article, so fuck, I don't know. It's like the birth of any movement, you can't point to a single genesis point. If it were so simple, we'd have a clear-cut answer on what the first slasher film is, or which anime girl first ran to school late with toast in her mouth. I suppose in this regard we can think of Rotsuki Doji as the John Carpenter's Halloween of tentacle hentai. It's got the pieces that were all scattered once upon a time and unifies them into one codified thing. What's weird though is that unlike Halloween, Rotsuki Doji didn't send off a million ships in its wake. I can't name two terribly many Rotsuki Doji imitators. I think everyone saw this thing and went, alright, yeah, that is the most tentacle porn a tentacle porn could ever be. Like, how do you get more unrestrained violent hedonism than this? This is the shit Cenobites would blush at. It's two minutes longer than Mulholland Drive. It's no fucking wonder this thing left such an impression on the generation of anime fans who accidentally saw it way too young. You do not just forget such images as guy licks blood off the face of a dude who just jizzed in public, woman gets fucked to death with beams of light, lesbian femdom alliance group explosion, racist caricature mascot character, or, or the dick severing scene. Can't forget about the dick severing scene. This is transgression for transgression, decadence for decadence. It's it's literally like, okay, take Devil Man, now suck out all the anxiety about war and prejudice, climate change, basically just fuck all of its brain cells out the window, but keep every last nerve ending, crank that shit to one billion, give it a pile of crack, a handgun, and a dead octopus, and boom, Urotsuki Doji. Jesus fucking Christ. And then nothing. The 90s hit a few years later, the bubble economy bursts, and that kind of decadence just fully stopped being appealing when the cash stopped flowing the same way. Arrow changed around that time too, which I think is no better reflected than how Hiroshi Harada recontextualized Shoujo Tsubaki in his adaptation in 92. 
But that's really for its own video, and also it was never released on home video, and also we literally shouldn't have access to it. Like, it was never meant for a home video release, period. So, okay, obviously Earth's Hidoji wasn't going to be the next Akira or anything, but everyone publishing anime outside Japan was looking for their very own next Akira. Maybe this one will do it? God damn, dude, I went to fucking school for this video. I finally smoked so many horrendously influential anime. I've talked about it before, but there's always this moment with this sort of thing where you go, oh, that's the genesis point of so many things I love. Vampire Hunter D might be the single biggest example, and man, what a beautiful balance of gothic elegance and pulp sensibilities. Class and swag have never paired better. Alright, pop quiz. What the fuck is better than a vampire western? A vampire western with a stoic leading man with a feral side and a strong, capable woman protagonist. That's what the fuck. Hetero rights, baby. These two are cute. Thank you for the Castlevania, Yoshitaka Amano. And thank you TM Network for being the leading, pioneering purveyors of Skung Base. Amidst all its seminalities, I feel like you can really feel its tone present in other OVAs of the time. From the dreary supernatural sadness of Vampire Princess Mew, to the dreary supernatural sadness of Laughing Target. You know, people forget that Rumiko Takahashi goes this hard by default. Look, the evil girl does the evil girl hair thing. The evil zone thing. Of all the trends I noticed in my research, the one I was most surprised by, purely for its specificity, was how much of a thing the segmented horror anthology with gothic sensibilities was. I think the public consciousness has kind of written off horror animation as something that isn't exactly in abundance, but doing this deep dive has really proven to me that, though niche, there was a slow but steady drip feed of horror anime in the VHS era. The Curse of Kazuo Umezu is the prime archetypical example here. It's based off a particular horror mangaka's works, it's broken up into segments, and it's super short. Kanako Inuki Shout Collection, Curse One Piece, and another based on Hideshi Hino's works I couldn't even find fill a similar criteria, but believe it or not, none of these were actually released on VHS to my knowledge, only the Umezu one. They all come theoretically recommended. Cursed One Piece in particular is of cultural note given its status as a very early Kyoani joint, but more importantly as an inductee into the anime ankle grab compendium. As for the Kazuo Umezu OVA, wouldn't you know I'm not really a huge Umezu fan? I think his work is a little too on the dry side for me, but that being said, I loved this thing, from what I can recall. See, I uh, watched this OVA after taking a pretty heavy dose of NyQuil while I was deliriously sick back when I was in the process of moving out of state, so my recollection of it is very hazy. Thing is, I mean this as a positive, I swear. I'm not really in a rush to see it again because I think this was the perfect scenario under which to see such an anime. It's that slow, solemn, dissociative kind of horror. In its creeping catatonia, there's a lot of space spent looking at characters, looking at things. It makes smart use of its clearly modest budget in this regard by being a very literal adaptation of the mangaka's sense of flow. When I think of Umezu, I think of girls looking shocked, frozen at something out of frame. It's been said to death, but the aesthetic traits of the VHS really heighten the horror genre. For this OVA, the dim, washed out images, the slight warbling lending a faint pulse to all the stillness in the animation, shit just generally feels haunted. Of course, I tried to craft a simulacrum of the VHS experience, but the main element I missed was the tactility of putting a tape into a VCR in a dark room and watching the glow of static give way to a piece of dark unnerving animation, where anything could happen before my eyes. In hindsight, I could have watched this shit on a CRT, but again, I was moving. All my shit was in storage, so cut me some slack. 
I can't stress enough though, I do not recommend getting sick while moving across state. That was some pretty astonishingly bad timing. But hey, if you do find yourself in my shoes, you know, go marinate some chicken breasts and some nighttime cold and flu medicine and just see how you get on. The Curse of Kazuo Umezu, best paired with cough syrup, Hazel 2021. Please don't, don't actually do that. Let, let the record show I don't endorse that. Of course, not all horror anime from the day followed this format, nor the gothic proclivities. Sometimes you'd get more contemporary shit. Shit like Hell Target, from the glut of space-themed horror that was popular at the time. No US release for this one, it seems like it came very, very close to being lost to time. Like, I think I watched a beta rip, with the most machine translated subs I've yet come across. But as for the OVA itself? Yeah, holy fuck, this thing is an honest to god 80 slasher. I did not know anime slashers existed. Slashers follow a pretty rigid format. It's pretty easy to pinpoint the formula after seeing just a few, and I think this is the only animated one I can think of. That's sick. And yeah, I loved this. It is very much what it is, and as such benefits greatly by being both barely over 50 minutes long and animated. Predominantly, it benefits from being animated because I'm pretty sure if it was live action, it would have been hit with the cease and desist of a lifetime by the production company of a one Mr. Roger Corman. Okay, this is context that's really fucking easy to miss if you're not a deranged psychopath with a near encyclopedic knowledge of trash garbage gutter street slime horror cinema like me Hazel, but this is basically an in all but name, nouns changed animated remake of the 1981 sci-fi slasher Galaxy of Terror. Galaxy of Terror being in and of itself an alien ripoff should theoretically make it distinct enough for me to simply call Hell Target an alien ripoff instead, but it's pretty beat for beat. A space crew separate on a mysterious planet and are picked off one by one by some kind of ill-defined psychic alien zombie ghost that manifests itself as the kind of sort of greatest fear of each named character until they're all wiped out. It's that half-baked but nonetheless memorable psychological aspect that differentiates Galaxy of Terror from Alien enough that Hell Target could be pulling inspiration from nothing else. But why Galaxy of Terror? This is a pretty fucking obscure movie in the grand scheme. I mean, I only learned about it from an old Cinemassacre Monster Madness video. Well, in addition to featuring Laura Palmer's mom, a scene where Sid Haig karate chops his own arm off, and a pretty infamous sequence where a large bug fucks a woman to death, Galaxy of Terror is pretty infamous for being an alien ripoff that had production design by James Cameron, then future director of Aliens, the sequel. But still, I don't really get how it shifted the needle enough that not only did it clearly inspire two OVAs I watched just for this video, but that that also makes it the most directly referenced movie of the bunch to my knowledge. Next to like fucking Star Wars or whatever, but like that's a given. I can only guess that, amongst other horror movies, it was passed around in tape trading circles after Cameron's marquee value brought it into the relative limelight, and that definitely happened in Japan too because it got a Japanese beta and laserdisc release at the time. I can't find any evidence of it being a cult hit there beyond these two bizarre references which both came several years after its release, so that's the best guess I can give. In fact, a lot of these OVAs bear a very clear reverence for international film, from Hong Kong action flicks, classic martial arts movies, to mainstream American blockbusters like Die Hard and the like. I would argue this influence is felt even more so than in TV anime given both how many OVAs were made without source manga, and for how much they were aping from cinema in general for their pacing and structure. And of course, this is influence that goes both ways. The novel Wicked City is based on was adapted into a live-action Chinese film, for example. But perhaps the most well-known and influential to cult cinema hounds in the West is actually an anime I've talked about in another video, 1998's Kite. This one took off almost certainly because of its very Western sensibilities and extreme violence intersecting directly with its elements that register even to non-weebs as being Japanese. That being, uh, it's the hentai shit mostly, and the cute girl. 
This caught the eye of a one Quentin Tarantino who famously based his character Gogo Yubari off of Sawa. But while Tarantino may be an average kite fan, I am the kite enjoyer. Because man, this thing has become very dear to me in the time since my Elfin lead video. Women turn 25 and pick one of these to base their entire personality off of. It's been difficult for me to ascertain in words, but this is a video with a script, so I'm gonna try anyway. Bear with me. What speaks so singularly to my limbic system in Kite is how it contrasts objective cruelty and subjective empathy, and how that pits its ethos against its pathos. To me, and I'm not saying I subscribe to this, Kite's primary philosophy states the world a horrible place that will never foster or encourage love, but that love while it lasts, and it will end, is the most important thing of all, the only thing with any hope of affecting positive change. It's nihilistic for sure, but I think I will always vibe with internal optimism struggling to overcome outward pessimism. In the world we live in, it can feel difficult to hold on to hope, but I think it's of utmost importance nonetheless. All right, all right, enough of this fucking gay shit. To circle back to Elfenlead, as my life has continued to, even in the wake of the literal 300 hours I put into my feature length video on the subject, like an empty can of Diet Mountain Dew endlessly circling the tub drain, Psycho Diver was directed by Mamoru Kanbe, you know, the Elfenlead director. And it also features a psychic girl. It wasn't produced by Studio Arms though. Ugh. I wanted to like this one more, I won't lie. Perfect bluey, elfin lady, but focuses too much on the psycho diving dude and not enough on the psychic having girl. So be it though, cause fuck all this other shit, this is the only OVA that has a vocal theme with a dance hall vocalist in it. That shit fucking knocks. Speaking of psychic powers, please bear with me, these segues are not easy. Dark Sea, Moon Shadow. This one's based on a manga by a pretty notoriously wild horror shoujo mangaka. There's a great video by Marion B on the subject, link in the description. In addition, there's also links to a whole bunch of other related videos that I compiled that I think you will enjoy if you enjoy this one. I, you know, I'll say it again, even though I said it in, in, during the, the title card, uh, that you can also find the song list. So if you find yourself going, oh, what the fuck is that song? It's there. It's there. Please look. It's there. Great color theming in this OVA, but it's another I had to watch without subs, even though subs are apparently available, uh, they're out there in some capacity, or at least were in the VHS fan subbing days, courtesy of subbing group Techno Girls. I fucking love this group's logo. Despite all I've talked about old anime culture, fan subs haven't really come up, but they were a huge part of the scene, and especially in the burgeoning years, created a few initial splinters in the western anime community. Some early groups would take mail-in orders, where you'd send in a blank VHS and they'd copy their sub to it and send it right back. This was usually done at dirt cheap. A lot of these dudes were hardly making production costs and were doing it purely for the love of the grind. Unfortunately, because this was all under the table shit, they'd often fuck up orders and you'd wind up with a totally different episode or series than the one you'd asked for. So be it though, anime's anime. Even if you had to watch it on ugly transfers hitting their fourth generation tape decay. There's a charm to that now, especially how it matches digital video compression. It's cozy in a way, but like mostly because you have access to the real thing. There's a lot of historied fan infighting and drama that would have to take its own video, but the primary concerns people had was about the legality and ethics therein. Yeah, technically this shit was illegal, and that continued even into the era where some series were getting officially subbed and dubbed, but were well behind the fan subbers. I'm enough of an anarchist in this regard that I'd like to suggest that the labor they put in was worth compensating, so long as everything was scrupulous and relatively above board 
harbor customer relations were concerned. Like, look, I've done my fair share of bulk shipping magnetic tape media. It's fucking hard. It's repetitive and it fucks up your wrists and tears up the skin on your fingers. I've done the same thing while simultaneously dubbing our own cassettes, which even faster than real time is still like 15 to 20 minutes per tape. Now add atop that, having to be in proximity to a hot CRT and two loud whirring VCRs. Those dudes were sweat shopping it for real. Yeah, you weren't always going to get a high quality translation out of it, but that's capital L labor. In particular, Dragon Ball was the fucking hotbed of fan sub drama, kind of microcosmic. Anime labs were the most famously controversial, adding a whole shitload of unnecessary curse words into the fucking Frieza arc or whatever. Like, fuck, one of the first things you learn about translation as a young weeb is that Japanese doesn't have any swears in the way we think of swears. And again, I talked about it like four goddamn hours ago. It makes sense under some circumstances to punch up a script with swears, but for something like Dragon Ball, it just doesn't feel quite right to hear Vegeta say anything heartier than damn. Much less fucking that, Jesus Christ. This is also one of the groups that had these infamous rap beef tier wrestling promo level messages at the start and end of their tapes, calling out other members of the scene. Fuck up, Hank. These weren't exclusive to Anime Labs, though. Perhaps the most infamous of the bunch was the fable of Miami Mike's Dragon Con hijinks. Look, I gotta settle some shit here. I think most of you have seen this image. Some of you have probably listened to the fantastic episode of the Anime Nostalgia Podcast about its many mysteries. But how many of you know that I have held the real truth betwixt my teeth for years? I know, I'm ashamed to have withheld this for so long. But let the record show it wasn't deliberate. I made a video about my discovery at the time, but I later privated that shit because my drip game was fucking abysmal. I looked like a fucking clown. My fit game was on some horrendous high school production of some cringe musical wardrobe costuming type shit. I know, as always, my vanity is what has chiefly driven my most arbitrary of decisions, but I need you all to respect that. Amidst my deeply unfortunate fleeting year of relearning how to dress myself after nearly two decades of dressing like I only listened to video game music, I reached out to Tenisar, the fan subber behind this infamous screed, which seemingly nobody in the search had attempted, which, you know, respecting a busy man's privacy is the morally correct thing to do here, but I mean, I had to know the truth here. That anime nostalgia podcast episode is great, truly, but it didn't confirm anything, merely speculated in a direction that made plenty of sense given the new anecdotal evidence. So, you know, I emailed the guy, letting him know that there was a bit of a cultural fascination that had formed around this image, and here was his response. I wasn't aware of any of what you mentioned. This happened so long ago, I really don't remember. My only memory of the only Dragon Con we attended was that the air conditioner on the van we took there broke, and they put our table behind the service elevator of the place. And later, a second message. Now that I think about it some more, I think I remember why. He got my friends, two other bootleggers who went under the names of Anime Labs, Project X, and a multitude of others pissed off, so we weren't going to sell to him. So he sent some of his employees to buy from us, and when we wouldn't sell to them, he actually sent one of his customers to buy from us. Or, at that Dragon Con, I had the exclusive on a hot anime, I won't mention the title, knowing that this would be the only title I would make money on. 
He had one of his lackeys buy one from us and made a bunch of copies to sell at the same show. There was an understanding, honor among thieves, so to say, with all of us and the other video dealers. When we had something new, since my friends and I were the only one subtitling anime at the time, they would buy them at the end of the show and sell copies in future shows. For Mike to do what he did was pretty scummy. My memory isn't what it used to be, but it was probably the latter. So there you have it. Fuck Miami Mike. <sighs> probably. I mean, cue the Phoenix Wright music. I mean, definitely fuck Miami Mike, but it would appear in the 11th hour, as I should have known, the plot has thickened. While trying to grab a screenshot of Tenisar's website, I stumbled across a tweet from Daryl Surratt stating Tenisar a false prophet. Daryl claims Tenisar was a bootleg operation who himself stole other people's subs. You'll note that Tenisar himself uses the term bootleg in his email to me, which I assumed initially was in reference to his bootlegging the anime itself, not the subs, but now I don't know. There's a blog on Tenisar's old angel fire where he specifies that he was convincing friends and friends of friends to translate for him, to which he would do the actual sub encoding on an Amiga. I won't say anything definitively, but I don't know that it makes a ton of sense to me that Anime Labs and company would be in this dude's leagues if he was no more than a bootlegger himself on the same level as types like Mike. Anime Labs themselves were infamous for their translations, after all. I suppose it would come down to cross-referencing fan subs from other groups to see if any subtitles are stolen. Still, I'm inclined to believe Daryl is correct in this statement, or that there is otherwise some truth there, but it's obviously some people's word against other people's, and that's not a call I want to make, so, you know, make of all that what you will. Tenisar, last I checked, is still distributing little-known Japanese cinema through his website. But yeah, bootlegs were a real problem for this burgeoning industry, from replicas of official releases filling up flea markets to the shit Tenisard talked about. Of course, bootlegging isn't the same as tape trading, that's a matter of sheer camaraderie. That was yet one more element of the VHS era that I couldn't capture, the communal factor. Western otaku would come together to communally watch tapes, like potluck style, in college AV rooms and cramped apartments. Yes, even if it was porno. Anime was anime, and I think that's kind of beautiful, honestly. Oliver e Ben! <laughs> just, just keep going louder. Uh, that's, that's, like a, that's like a parody of itself. That's not even the real Dendi anymore. R.I.P. Dendi. In doing research for this video, a viewer pointed out a semi-local, non-profit archivist video rental place called Scarecrow, which I promptly visited. Of course, it's 2021, most of their stock was DVD and Blu-ray, but there was still the occasional VHS, which was pretty wild to see. As a kid, going to places like Blockbuster and Hometown Hero Silver Screen Video was where I had some of my first brushes with capital A anime. Seeing weird etchy anime covers and bursting into a cold sweat, or crossing paths with art house shit like the goat Nekojiru. My fondest memory was renting Outlaw Star and watching all of it over a weekend where my family took a trip out to the middle of nowhere to visit some relatives, just totally hogging the TV in one of the bedrooms. While browsing the extensive anime section at Scarecrow, I kept thinking, man, we have it so good now, but at the same time, digital archival efforts are so disjointed. All I want is to see Dragon's Heaven at 1080p, or at least a clean rip without any digital compression. In a perfect world, there would be meaningful incentives for rights holders to digitize any and all 16mm reels they have access to. My wife and I have been rewatching Tenchi Universe, and dude, the Laserdisc Transfer Funimation streaming service uses looks like fucking ass. The degradation of visual fidelity is still a loss, even if not as much as a work's entire absence. And even still, it can sometimes be as simple as an upload being taken down or a torrent losing all of its cedars for something to just slip right through the cracks. I'm thankful for Scarecrow's efforts in recognizing the importance of physical media in addition to digital in our modern age. One particular work that feels as though it could slip right out of reach at any moment is the aforementioned Hiroshi Hirata's 1985 film, The Death Lullaby. 
I don't know how this thing isn't lost. It's so brazenly independent and carries such a sputtering countercultural fury that's conveyed even through the machine translated unofficial subtitles. The mixed media approach, stilted pacing, and disorienting imagery make this thing feel truly dangerous. It's ugly, scary, all deliberate, of course. It's a fucking feat that I believe was entirely animated start to finish by just one man, or so the story goes. In many regards, the death lullaby feels like it should be lost, like something that should have been snuffed out for being too out there to find any meaningful commercial success, which is tragically synonymous with archival in so many instances. Thank god it isn't lost though, it's a fucking masterwork through and through. This is why I get the continued belief people hold for the existence of things like Saki Sanabashi. I can guarantee you, what we have access to isn't more than two thirds of the anime that has existed. So it goes, who's to say there wasn't an anime that did its time floating around from site to site before silently fading away. I simply could not find one of the anime I'd set out to watch for this video. I won't say it's lost, but it's certainly not around. And that's one out of about 35. Dream Hunter M, which I believe has attracted as much a cult following in the West these days as it had in Japan in its day, could have risked the same fate had it not hooked the audience it did. Maybe I'm over-exaggerating a bit, but the story infamously goes that the first OVA, which had a handful of pornographic sequences, got popular enough purely for its plot that the studio behind it shifted gears, re-edited the first episode to remove the H scenes, and began producing the rest of the OVAs for a more general otaku audience. I, of course, watched the uncensored original version, and I cannot wrap my head around what a re-edit of this would look like, because the premise of this OVA is that Rem is tasked with helping a girl who's at risk of dying from a masturbation overdose. Okay, that's kind of great though. Wouldn't you fucking know also, this is the first anime to feature an erotic scene between a girl and a tentacle. I only watched the first episode, admittedly, I had to keep shit rolling, but I loved this thing. Cute characters, over the top story, Rem openly floating with the serial jerker right at the end, family fun all around. But what says family fun more than the blue girl? I've discovered that I've developed a bit of a system for engaging with hentai for this channel, something I've come to call a porn threshold. This is admittedly a loose rubric, one I can't define, but I know it when I see it, when I watch something that has just a bit too much porn for me to find value worth reporting outside of its uh, utility. For Westerners in my age bracket anyway, La Blue Girl is about as infamous as Orotsuki Doji, although it's far less well regarded, removed from all the gallons of seed spilled over it. And yeah, I don't know, it was kind of unwatchably porny, but in a way that I found wrapped back around into being kind of charming. It's that listless, twirls hair, absentmindedly, constantly giving fuck me eyes pacing where everyone's fucking all the time and in front of anyone and for any and every reason imaginable. The perfect balance within the porn threshold I found was a little OVA from 1994 called Butt Attack Punisher Girl Gotaman. In what is probably the most equal opportunity blasphemous story I've ever seen told in the medium of animation, this is the story of a good little Christian girl attending the perfect religion academy, who is granted never nude superpowers by Buddha that allows her to fight any foe she pleases with her ass. Yeah, Keijo's a fucking ripoff. You ever seen one of those Keijo bitches catch a sword within the clap of her cheeks? I think the fuck not. I actually don't know if that happens in Keijo or not. I haven't seen Keijo. Would you be shocked if I told you this OVA was just barely too obscure and too niche to get an official localization? Hopefully someday, but in the meantime, thanks fansubbers. This thing fucking owns. Genuinely one of my favorite things I watched for this video. Plus it's simple fact that everything is better with lesbian subtext. Check the romantic tension here, Jesus Christ. Good fucking shit. Okay, fuck, finally, we've reached our last OVA, Plastic Little by Satoshi Urushihara. Probably the objective best of the bunch, at least in its blend of relative accessibility and quality. Don't get me wrong, there's still enough tit bouncing for ADV to have implemented a jiggle counter in their DVD release. 
They counted 49, which is literally more than one per minute. The absolute maniacs. Cheers, y'all. Speaking of romantic subtext, this OVA has some crazy lesbian undertones too. Another win, my fellow bimbos. Like, Jesus Christ, just look at the lyrics to this ending theme. This thing is fucking gorgeous across the board, really. It's a simple story told simply, and it's very, very cozy as a result. It was a perfect way for me to close out my journey. Yeah, in addition to being a good stopping point for this video, this was the last OVA I watched. Despite seeking out OVAs from this era in particular, I only learned about halfway through my research that the late 80s and very early 90s are referred to pretty consistently as the golden age of anime by fans of the old school shit. Having now sampled a breadth of examples from the time, I can absolutely see what they're getting at. The quality of animation and the sheer saturation of creatively rich anime coming out of the time was really fucking impressive, and pound for pound probably unmatched. But you see people of different generations call every decade the golden age. The 70s are lauded as the best for being the veritable birth of modern anime, bringing us space opera giants like Harlock and Galaxy Express, the first works of Yoshiyuki Tomino, not to mention Miyazaki and Takahata's directorial debuts, <laughs> RuPaul III and shit. There are plenty of people, around my age especially, who see the 90s as the greatest decade for anime, a time when exacerbated socio-political circumstances brought the medium to the apex of postmodernism. Ava, Lane, Ghost in the Shell, Perfect Blue, Samurai Pizza Cats. This was, in a lot of regards, the time for introspective viewer-critical works primed for modern-day kino connoisseurs. I was working on a fucking gargantuan video about all this for a while, but I wound up shelving it. Damn, maybe I should go back to that. I'd even guess, if we aren't already, it won't be too terribly long before we see people who argue the aughts were the best decade for anime. And you know, I can see where that comes from too. Genres got especially codified around this time, and in addition to seeing some of those genres hit their absolute peaks, it in turn led to a lot of subversive deconstructions cropping up in works that otherwise come off as standard fare. In addition, there was also a steady flow of cinematic powerhouses, like the aforementioned Nekojiru, Metropolis, and the latter few Satoshi Kon films. Also, lots of people adore Mamoru Hosoda and Makoto Shinkai, who both had their anime film directing debuts in the aughts. I don't think it's quite as simple as saying the decade you grew up in is always going to be the one you like most. Like, of course it's not that simple, but I do think certain aesthetic and narrative traits appeal to different people differently, and the overall subjective quality of a given decade is going to hinge pretty heavily on those tastes and inclinations. As for me, it's probably going to sound like a cop-out, but I don't have a favorite decade. All women are queens, after all. And I hope the array of subjects my channel covers and will cover in the future speaks to my interest in anime across all periods and genres. Plus, you know, I don't think that we're ever going to see an art form peak in our lifetimes. So what's the big takeaway with all of this? If I can impart anything onto those of you who have made it all the way to the end, is that we should all take more risks in our media consumption habits. There's a lot of cool underrated art out there that does weird shit you won't find anywhere else. It's fun as fuck and just as rewarding too to champion something you found yourself through whichever weird way. Internet fan culture is in a sort of weird spot right now where things are simultaneously splintered yet still homogenized. And I think instead of getting angry or defensive or exhausting undue energy on whatever the most popular popular version of the thing you like is at that moment, you should like trawl genre tags on platforms like MyAnimeList or Annualist or Anime News Network or Letterboxd or Backlogged or Goodreads or whatever the fuck. Or follow the left field media consumption habits of a fuck-brained raving internet woman you've never met. Trust me, it makes you cool to like shit nobody cares about. Get out there and find your own butt attack punisher girl Gotamon. Dream hunt your own REMS. Support your local library. Steal from the government.